So thank you very much, pharmacy department for this uh, opportunity. Yeah, please carry on. Ah, good. So sorry for the disruption. Please go. Yes. Yeah, so, so traditionally we looked at heart failure in two perspectives. That is heart failure with systolic dysfunction and then diastolic dys dysfunction. The two concepts were considered independent. But with time, it became obvious that patients with systolic dysfunction frequently also mm -hmm. had diastolic dysfunction. And so because of that, the reclassification mm -hmm. was done. Mm -hmm. And this was done based on echocardiography. And remember, uh, I should mention that echo is the gold standard for diagnosing heart failure. So now we consider heart failure principally from two perspectives. Heart failure with reduced ejection fraction and then heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. Ejection fraction is a simple measure of contractility of the heart. A normal ejection fraction should ordinarily range from 50% and above, depending on the method that you use. So now we look at our patients from the perspective of heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. Those are patients who have problems with contractility and may also have problems with cardiac relaxation. The other group of patients are patients with um, heart failure with preserved ejection fraction who have no problem with contractility, but whose problems are mainly with inadequate relaxation of the heart within the heart failure. <laughs> now, this um, just shows this um, classification. I've gone this length to just create a background for the patient I will discuss and to highlight the fact that I will be talking about a patient who has heart failure with reduced ejection fraction and then raise some common therapeutic issues, sorry, some issues in the therapeutics of such patients. Now, the treatment of heart failure, the therapeutics of heart failure. You know, heart failure has about three or four domains of management. That is um, drug treatment, lifestyle modification, cardiac rehabilitation, and then device therapy. But in essence, we'll be focusing only on drug treatment. Drug treatment of heart failure is actually targeted at the different pathophysiologic events that occur in heart failure. And these are principally divided into three. Two of those events, two of those events, or rather cascade of uh, events, are compensatory and um, helpful in the short term, but eventually become deleterious and worsen the condition of the heart. And these are the activation of the sympathetic nervous system and then the activation of the renin and ketensin aldosterone system. There is another system in the heart which um, is beneficial, but which unfortunately is short-lived, is a compensatory system, and that is the natriuretic uretic peptide system. And that is a system where the atrial natriuretic peptide, the B type natriuretic peptide, which are naturally occurring peptides, which are released by the myocardium in response to cardiac stretch and stress, which is what are causing heart failure. Unfortunately, the products of this system, which are beneficial, are usually short lived, uh, as I will mention in a short while. So, the treatment of heart failure, every drug treatment in heart failure 
is actually targeted towards different elements of this um, response to the feeling heart. More specifically, when a patient begins to develop heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, what happens is that the heart fails to pump out enough blood to meet up with the body's metabolic demand. Simply put, in heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. And one of the early sequelae of this is the activation of the sympathetic nervous system, which leads to the secretion of epinephrine and noepinephrine, and this leads to increased vessel constriction. Peripherally, in order to improve tissue perfusion, this impact through adrenal activation also leads to the activation of the renin angiotensin adosterone cascade, production of um, angiotensin 2, angiotensin 1 converted to angiotensin 2. And you know, all these lead to basal constriction in order to maintain tissue perfusion. This is good in the short term, but on the long term, it's harmful to the heart because it promotes abnormal hypertrophy of the heart, it promotes fibrosis of the heart, and then worsens the heart rate. Simple adrenal activation causes increase in heart rate in order to increase the stroke volume and increase the cardiac output. It causes an increase in contractility of the heart. All these look good in the short term, but on the long term, they are harmful and they cause further myocardial damage. On the other side, is a positive response, which is the secretion of the natriuretic peptide. That is um, atrial natriuretic peptide and then the B-type natriuretic peptide from the ventricles. These ones uh, reduce blood pressure, they increase sodium and water excretion, they reduce mouse site fibrosis, they reduce mouse site hypertrophy and aim to preserve the myocardium. So as you will see shortly in the patient that will run quickly, therapeutic targets in heart failure usually revolve around all these different elements in order to help the patient get better and improve patient outcome. The specimen patient uh, is uh, Mr. S.A., a 63-year-old man a known hypertensive of about 20 years, a known type 2 diabetic patient, and a known osteoarthritis patient. Many times, you and I know that this is a patient's come with multiple comorbidities. He presented in the emergency room with, basically with symptoms of heart failure, shortness of breath, which has been worsening, easy fatigability, cough, and then paroxysmal Natural, sorry, paradisma nocturnal dyspnea, which is a um, patient waking up suddenly from sleep with a choking feeling like he's about to die because of sudden difficulty in breathing, occurring while lying supine. He also had leg sweat. So, on general examination, this is usually how our patients come. They come in cyanose, they are in extreme distress. So many would have many will have beaten bigger edema and then pulse rate in this patient was completely irregular. Please note that that is also one of the features they come with cardiac arrhythmias, and that is why the pulse appears to be normal within normal limits. By the time you count the heart rate in this patient, then you get a proper impression of um, cardiac activity, and then you confirm arrhythmia with an ECG. Yes, they usually come in tachypnic and then they have hepatomegaly like we all need. So this patient gets hospitalized. Now, investigations in heart failure to confirm heart failure, an echo was done and then the ejection fraction was at 2%. And then it was managed as a patient with heart failure. Reduce injection fraction. The 
because injection fraction was less than 40. The ECG also showed atrial fibrillation, and his heart rate was actually 115 beats per minute. And then we usually do an X ray, a chest X ray, which will just show uh, cardiomegaly, and then show the other complications like chest infection or pleural effusion. Now, this is what it looks like. Sorry, my video is using to play, but I would not agree with that. So please, let's see. This is what this patient's heart looks like. This is the left atrium. This is the left ventricle, which pumps blood to the aorta and to the body. And you can see that this left ventricle is just rocking. It's not contracting well at all. It's not contracting well at all. It's just rocking. This is what happens in heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. And you can practically imagine how this reduced contractility will lead to a reduced cardiac output and lead to that cascade of events that I've described earlier, sympath adrenal activation, RAS activation, and so on. Now, this is what it should look like ordinarily. This is what it should look like. This is a left ventricle that is contracting very well. Okay? So this is just to help us to have a visual appreciation of what happens in heart failure. And so other investigations are done for this patient. Uh, Full block count, platelet count, including platelet counts, and then the blood, blood chemistry. Uh, sodium is within normal limits, potassium is within normal limits. Uh, urea and creatinine, urea, ure, yeah, they are slightly elevated, and it's um, estimated GFR. I know the pharmacists will be very interested in this because this factor also determines to a large extent uh, drugs we use, dosing, dosage, frequency of dosage, and so on. Yeah, so this is the initial treatment this patient had. And uh, like I mentioned earlier, specific treatment of heart failure depends on our need to target the different aspects of the pathophysiology of the disease. One, two, specific drug choices in heart failure are also guided by randomized control trials, which have been carried out over the years in heart failure patients to objectively define benefits, benefit for outcome, benefits in reducing hospitalization, benefits in reducing mortality, as the case may be. So that's why you find the patient placed on IV frosimide for decongestion because of the leg swelling. The patient was also placed on Valsartan, 80 milligram daily. The Valhelp trial is a very old trial, and that's a trial that demonstrated the benefits of Valsartan in um, improving mortality of heart failure patients. Of course, uh, coronary studies have been carried out in other and receptor blockers. The LIFE study for Dosatan, CHAM study, CHAM added for Candisatan and so on and so forth. The patient was later changed to the period, that is um, Sacubitiv Asatan, which is the relatively new molecule uh, based on the Pioneer study, which uh, showed the benefit of uh, Imperio in hospitalized patients, improving outcomes in patients hospitalized with heart failure. And then the Paradigm Heart Failure Study, which showed long term benefits compared to Enalapril in achieving a 20% reduction in mortality of this patient. The patient was also placed on metoprolol, spironolactone, 
And then being a diabetic, it was placed on glamipiride and metformin. I should have mentioned earlier that um, his lipid profile was during, and so it was placed on rosuvastatin. And then he's been on it was for pedogram from our patient, and that was continued and as an expected therapy. Because of his uh, arthritis, he came in with um, severe knee pains, and then diclofenac was added to the medication. Lifestyle modification, issues with future cardiovascular rehabilitation, uh, issues with need for device therapy, I will not go into in this patient to be out of the scope of our discussion. So the therapeutics of uh, heart failure is, um, is interesting. And this is a simple algorithm from the European Society of Cardiology guidelines on managing heart failure, drug treatment of heart failure patients. If you look at the left side of the bar, all patients are expected to receive diuretics as may be needed when they have symptoms or signs of fluid congestion. And this is useful at every stage of the disease, depending on how patient it is. Uh, next is the need for device therapy in patients with ejection fraction less than 5%. Uh, but I will not go into this, as I mentioned earlier. But suffice to just say that the management of heart failure patients, as you can see, depends on so many factors. I mean, optimal, optimal medical management depends on you having an accurate echocardiography. Uh, it depends on you uh, looking at patient's age, looking at how well you have optimized medical therapy before considering other modalities of treatment. Now, uh, after diuretics in heart failure, which reduce ejection fraction, patient is uh, recommended to have ACE inhibitor or if not tolerated, an intensive receptor blocker and then a beta blocker. If patient remains symptomatic, like if these are patients, uh, spironolactone or epirinone, mineralocortical receptor antagonist uh, can be added. And then if patient still remains uh, symptomatic, and angi angiotensin receptor blocker and nebulizing inhibitor combination, that's a pursuit of certain, can be added, yeah, can be added to replace the ACE inhibitor, the ACE inhibitor or the uh, I must mention that there are different perspectives with respect to this point of the humanity. Okay, actually with um, the pioneer study, we should benefit starting and the LD while patient is on bed. ECG findings can also determine what patient gets. If a patient has a long QRS duration, he may need device. I won't go into that. If patient is in sinus reading and persistently has a heart rate above 70 beats per minute, then he may be a candidate who will benefit from ibabradin. Ibabradin is a sinoatrial node blocker. It blocks the IF current in the sinoatrial node. And the simple logic behind reducing heart rate in heart failure is to reduce the work of the myocardium and ultimately reduce myocardial oxygen demand. Okay, as the case may be. And then the patient remains systematic, sorry, symptomatic after all these levels, such patients become candidates to receive the drugs in or more advanced uh, treatment modalities. So what are the issues? Because the topic I chose was uh, issues in the management of heart failure. What are the issues in management of heart failure? One, the, the age of the patient. Most patients with heart failure uh, in our environment are over the age of 55. They are in late middle age, 
to elderly. In the advanced world, our fellow patients are actually far older. So these issues are more significant in their own patients because the mean age of their patient is of studies is as high as 70, 70 years. In our own environment, from studies done in Nigeria, the mean age of our fellow patients in the last 10 years, 10 to 12 years, has grown from 43 years to 58 years. Uh, it's only from recent reviews that we have found out that our own heart failure patients are also older. Patients are living longer in Nigeria now before developing heart failure, which I think is, uh, is an indication of uh, probably some improvement in our healthcare, some improvement in primary prevention of um, heart failure risk factors, and then probably reflecting the general aging of the population. Life expectancy is higher, and so on and so forth. So you find that a good number of heart failure patients are older. They are in late middle age, or they are elderly, and then, because of that, they will necessarily carry a number of comorbidities. If hypertension was the cause of the heart failure, you find that many of them have developed diabetes along the line. Some even have malignancies that they also been managed for. Uh, and then, of course, this will spiral to the economic issues because uh, economic, the economics of mind heart failure is a very expensive condition to manage. And many of these patients will be retired or nearing their retirement. They may not be so productive anymore. The other issue in heart failure management, which I know this audience will be very interested, is the issue of polypharmacy. Necessarily, because of the nature of the condition, these patients are exposed to a lot of polypharmacy. Because in heart failure, you have several mechanisms playing out at the same time, several compensatory mechanisms playing out at the same time. Some of them uh, are harmful, most of them, indeed most of them are harmful and easily propagated down the line with the beneficial arm being naturally limited. That's the natural resin peptide production being naturally limited by the enzyme nephrilizing. Nephrilizing is also a naturally occurring enzyme which breaks down all right, thank you very much. So, polypharmacy is also an issue uh, with this patient. Then, of course, packing on uh, polypharmacy is the issue of drug drug interaction. And um, I'll show a table after this which shows a typical challenge that we have in managing this patient. The other issues uh, also relate to the treatment of the primary etiology of heart failure. We know that the most common etiology in our environment here is um, hypertension. But a few of these patients develop heart failure from other causes, for example, from thyroid disease. And so you find that if they develop heart failure from hypothyroid disease, then they will also be on a steroid drug. And if they have certain arrhythmias, some of the common antiarrhythmic drugs that we have in our environment here, like amiodarone, as you all know, interferes with thyroid function. And so you have a dilemma. You have to make other choices which may not be as effective or which may not be available. And then as I mentioned earlier, and as we had in this particular patient, the treatment is also always confounded by the presence of comorbidities. For example, this patient had um, diabetes mellitus, and then the choice was to use glimepiride and metformin. The older generation sulfonylurea, glibenclamide, carry a higher cardiovascular risk in heart failure patients than the newer generation ones. Otherwise, glibenclamide may have been an option for this patient because it's cheaper, it may be easier for him to get, okay? But here, glimepiride was the choice that was made. Then you see the patient also having to take diclofenac 
and said are known to what's so we have five minutes more on this yes back. all right thank you very much i'm almost rounding up now so a drug like um, diclofenac ordinarily will not be should not be, be used in heart failure patients but you find that some of these patients have pain so bad that they will not get a control of pain from the other options you have. The other options are uh, paracetamol, codeine, uh, tramadol. They may not have any respite from them at all, or they react to them. And you are left with using only an NSAID. And then you ask yourself, an NSAID used for a short period, will it worsen fluid retention? Isn't for just a short period and not um, not prolonged as the case may be. So these are issues that um, confront us. And then treatment of complications. Because treatment of complications mean that you have to bring in more drugs. Like this patient had um, atrial fibrillation. Uh, beta blockers are among the mainstay of treatment for atrial treatment of atrial fibrillation. But at times they are inadequate to give you a rate control. And then you have to bring in other agents like um, amiodarone or bring in other agents like uh, digoxin. Digoxin is ordinarily not a first line heart failure medication anymore. But when patients have arrhythmias, then you consider bringing it. In. And then when you now long this with the renal function of the patient, then the issues of monitoring of drug levels coming to prevent toxicity. And we all know how toxic toxin can be, the narrow therapeutic uh, window it has, and all that. So these are the issues. So this is an example of a table from uh, Brownwater Group of Medicine, which shows the effects the use of digoxin has on the use of other heart failure medication. For example, uh, if a patient would have digoxin and um, amiodarone, we have to use lower doses. We use lower doses of digoxin in order to achieve good therapeutic effect from the amiodarone, as the case may be. So these are some of the issues uh, with uh, therapeutics of a patient with heart failure. Thank you very much for listening.